going to get something to eat. It depends on how long the pastor goes, but I'm just going to set up out there and use this as an outreach for Vacation Bible School and to invite people to come to church. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead to you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship God. Do not copy behaviors and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. God's word is true and strong. In today's church, the church of Jesus Christ, when we come in here and worship, we need to come with a clean heart. We need to give him all the struggles and the worries of the world and be a true living sacrifice to him and just clear everything out of our minds and love on our God because he's loved on us, has he not? He's done the greatest thing by giving his son Christ for an old sinner like me. A lot of times that we can just sit around and talk about our past and oh, how we used to be. But what we need to do is sit around and talk about what he's done for us and how he's changed that past. And let the world see the living sacrifice that he's made us. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, Lord, and I thank you that we're able to come and worship you with all of our hearts and our minds and our souls. God, you are a big God. You're beyond all the comprehension that we have in our mind. But one thing's for certain, Lord, your word is true. And when we act upon your word, Father God, you move in our hearts and our minds and you correct the things about us, Lord. You show us who we are and what you expect of us, Father God. Now, as we go through this worship part of the service, Lord, have your way in our hearts and our mind, Lord. Just look into our hearts and cleanse our minds and hearts from this world. Let us draw nigh to you, Father God, because we know your word says that when we draw nigh to you, Satan flees. He runs away from us, Father God. Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem this day, Lord. We ask that you have your way there, Lord. We know that you're in control. Father, we pray for our nation this morning. We pray for our president. Many of us aren't happy or satisfied with him, but Lord, you appointed him. Now, God, have your way in his heart and his mind, and I know that prayer changes things, God. Let us take our eyes off of man, Lord, and turn boldly upon you, Lord. And look for your guidance and your love. Help us, Lord, this day. Clear our minds and our heart that we could draw closer to you. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was, who is, and who is to come. Amen. Good morning, friendship. I forgot to let Mark announce. Um, so we're going to try to do a church clap challenge. And if you guys want to watch it, it's a song we usually won't do, but <laughs> the kids love it. They just, they just go crazy over the song. Um, and there's like a, a dance that can go with it. So we would like to put together a collection of everybody that turns one in to doing the, the church clap. And we'll just kind of piece it together and just show it one Sunday. So well, I guess to the end of October, you know, we could do it then. But uh, just listen to the song. The kids love it. And but we would just love to, to put that together as a church and just have a collection of that song with everybody kind of dancing with it. That would be great. But, all right, would y'all like to stand? We'll start worship. Welcome to Friendship. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest rod and stone, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are
Christ alone Who took on flesh Fullness of God in helpless pain This gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones He came to save
up his majesty Jesus who died now glorified King of all kings y'all can sing it it looks like the things are down this morning so we'll just try our best y'all know this to sing it with us just worship God this morning majesty Worship His Majesty Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise Majesty Kingdom authority
God never fails us. You know, just when we feel like we're just alone. He's not around. He's there. I think we've all are going through something, coming out of something, coming out of it. We have to lean on each other. I know Ryan and I have been going through pretty much the same thing. And it just seems like God uses us. I know He does. I 
I've seen things I wish I hadn't seen Just the thought of your amazing grace And I cry, Jesus, forgive me And I fall down to my knees with a hammer in my hand You look at me, arms open Forgiven, forgiven Child, there is freedom from all of it You can say goodbye to every sin You are forgiven I could have been six feet under I could have been lost forever Yeah, I should be in that fire But now there's fire inside of me Here I am a dead man walking No grave gonna hold God's people All the weight of all of our evil Lifted away forever free Who could believe, who could believe You love me even when I don't deserve it Forgiven, I'm forgiven Jesus, your blood makes me innocent So I will say goodbye to every sin Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. Lord, for your house, for your worship. Father, we just lift up praise and honor to you this morning. You are our creator, you are our father. And we thank you for just loving us the way that you do. This morning, I would pray, Lord, that this message would be all about you and you only. Father, we just thank you. We offer up praise and glory in your son's name. Amen. been a lot of complaining lately about the weather. It's hot out there. I don't know if you've noticed. The dial's gone up just a little bit. But you know, we should be like a grape. You know you know, a grape, Jeff. A grape, a little grape. Grapes never complain. They might whine a little, but they never complain. Okay. That was in the book, just to be clear. That was not mine. <laughs> Today, we are on a new topic, a new book. We are in 1 Corinthians this morning. And the name of the sermon is Trust in His Plan. Now, I say that, and we're going to find out why, but, you know, trusting in anything is difficult. How many here have a hard time trusting something you don't understand or know? Okay, yeah, there should have been a lot more hands probably. You know, I don't understand people who jump out of airplanes. That makes no sense to me. But I can tell you this, if I were to jump out, I would want to know that I packed my own parachute. I would want to know that it was done right. I wouldn't want to rely on someone else. In other words, I would have to trust that the thing that's strapped to my back is something that I know intimately, inside and out. I would want to know that I knew how to do that. I also have a healthy fear for the ocean. Now, I go in the ocean, and I swim in the ocean, and, and, and we've snorkeled all over the, uh, the Caribbeans, and, and I've seen sharks and, and turtles and everything else. But the level that I go to, the depth is probably no higher than the ceiling. 
you start getting out of depths that you can't see the bottom, that's something I don't want to venture into. Why? I don't know anything about what's under me. I haven't spent enough time under the water to go, yes, I'm comfortable here. Now, people who surf their whole lives or people who spent their whole lives in the water, they're more than comfortable doing that. They swim around and they see a shark and they just think that's an everyday occurrence. That is not an everyday occurrence for me. That is a, oops, I screwed up, I'm in the wrong place kind of occurrence. In other words, I don't trust what I don't know. I can't understand what I don't know. And this morning, we're going to talk about what it means to know God and know his ways and how we can understand that. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians 2, starting with verse 1. And this is Paul writing here. When I came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words or impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. In other words, to tell you the mysteries of God. Now make no mistakes, Paul was educated. We know that, right? Paul's an educated individual. He could have used lofty words if he wanted, but he chose not to because he understood the audience that he was speaking to. There was no need to talk down to anyone. One pastor that I worked with for years, and I think I've mentioned this before, the first time I met him and we sat down for an interview, I knew that this guy was a, I'm setting myself up here, I know. I knew he was a lot smarter than I was. <laughs> okay, I know that doesn't take a lot. I know it doesn't take a lot. But this guy, you could just tell he was intelligent. He had his doctorate, and you just knew by talking to him that if he wanted to, he could talk all the way up here and leave you behind. But what I appreciated and loved about him was that he talked down here. There was no need to use these words here. It was just he and I talking. He didn't have to be pretentious. He didn't have to put on an air. Yes, he understood those things and he knew those things. And when it came to the life of John Wesley, he could have talked circles around almost anybody. But he chose not to do that because he understood that the gospel wasn't about him. It was about Jesus Christ. A lot of people out there that preach want to talk about how much they've done and how much they know and how much they understand. Look, if someone in the church is trying to convince you how much they know, I would question how much do they really know. There's no need for us to walk around and brag about how smart we are or how close we are to God. I don't need people coming to me going, you just don't know how close God and I are. I, I, mean, I, I don't. I don't know. That's between you and God. It doesn't matter to me. I don't need to know how close you are to God. I just need to know that you love him. I love him. That's all that really matters. I mentioned Wednesday night that there's a pastor who I agree with at least probably 80% of the time online who has recently come out in one of his sermons and said, I have done more than Jesus did when he was on this earth. Now, it might be innocent enough. I know what he's implying. He's implying that I have preached over 40-some years. Okay, well, Jesus only lived three, 33 and a half. If we assume he only preached that three and a half, then yes, he's preached more. But Jesus' whole life was a ministry, first of all, not just the years that he preached. And second of all, I can preach until I'm 189, and I still would not have done more than Jesus did because I can't die on a cross. I mean, I can, but it really doesn't do anything but kill me. It does nothing for you. But when Jesus died on the cross, it did everything. It bridged the gap between us and a God that we weren't fit to be talking to. Jesus did that for us. But he goes on to say that I've done more than Jesus has done. That's scary. Because Romans 12, 3 says, for by the grace of God given to me, I say to every one of you, not to think more highly of himself and of his importance and ability than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has a portion to each a degree of faith and a purpose designed for service. You see, everyone has been given something by God, meaning that none of us are more important than the person sitting next to us. 
We are all children of God. We've all been called to do something. That doesn't make any one of us greater than the other. And so Paul says, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. Isn't that really what it comes down to? It all comes down to the gospel of Jesus Christ and nothing else. I came to you in weakness, timid, and trembling. Now, I've read commentaries that said, well, maybe he was going through an illness at that time. Maybe it was something he picked up in Corinth. See, I think he was weak and timid and trembling because he was standing before the cross and he understood that he was not worthy of what he was preaching. But he was called to do it anyway. See, any person who stands up here and says that they are not weak, any person that stands up here and says that they are not afraid to speak, they're too proud. You should be afraid of what you speak because our words have eternal implications. And we need to make sure that we're speaking what God is asking us to speak and not what we want to speak. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would not trust in human wisdom, but in the power of God. Everything that we do and say should be bathed in the Holy Spirit. It should be bathed in prayer. If we're saying it just because we want to say it, then it doesn't go any further than this podium. It just drops off. You see, the sermons that really touch you has nothing to do with me or any other person who stands up here. It has to do with the fact, is the Holy Spirit speaking to the speaker, and are they speaking to the receiver? If you're hearing it and you're feeling it, it has nothing to do with what I'm saying and everything to do with the fact that the Holy Spirit is touching your heart. And if that's happening, you better respond. We need not to trust in what we do. You don't need to follow me. You don't need to follow the words that I say. We just need to follow what God is saying. There's no man that we should be following. You know, did anybody here watch the debate? You can be honest, it's okay. I saw one meme that showed a clip from Grumpy Old Man, the movie. And the two of them just arguing back and forth. Why do we put so much stock into following two men who have nothing to do with Jesus Christ? It doesn't mean a thing. Now, I'm not saying don't vote. We're all going to vote. We're going to vote to who we think will do the best. But why do we put so much stock in a man? We're to follow no man other than Jesus Christ. And yet, we're, we're freaking out in this country because we don't know who's going to be president. And I tell you, it doesn't matter because God already knows. So it doesn't matter. Yet, when I'm among mature believers... All right, this is going to sting a little bit. Mature believers. Let's, let's stop right there. We don't got no further. A mature believer is someone who doesn't act like a child within the church. A mature believer is someone who forgets their scripture and talks before they pray, talks before they read. In other words, a mature Christian understands that anything I do has to be coming from scripture, has to be coming through prayer. In other words, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about this before. If we're still on milk, we can't be mature. We have to be on meat. That's the difference between mature Christians. I'm not saying if you're on milk, you're not a Christian. That's not what I'm saying. You can be a student and be in first grade, and you can be a student and be in 12th grade. That doesn't mean the first grader knows everything that the 12th grader knows. We're all at different levels of our faith. Yet when I'm among mature believers, I do speak with words of wisdom, but not the kind of wisdom that belongs to this world or to the rulers of this world who are soon forgotten. There's a thing that happens. The world's wisdom is not the same as our wisdom. How do we know that? Look at the laws that we have on the books that we think are smart, but yet fly in the face of Christianity. We're going on men's wisdom not God's wisdom. They are two completely different things. You know, something that God has revealed to me, and maybe it's just because I was getting tired. I used to, when someone would say something on Facebook and I, and I disagreed with all my heart, 
I will try to convince them of my belief. But see, they're not in the place to hear it. When someone says all churches are just money hungry, well, that's where they're at right now. They need someone who can love on them and sit down with them and show them that church is different than what he thinks or she thinks. That doesn't happen behind a keyboard on Facebook. I'm sorry, it just doesn't. That happens when you, de- when you develop relationships with people and you love on them. They start to see the world the way that we see it, which is through God's eyes, God's wisdom, and not our own. No, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God. His plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for the ultimate glory before the world began. So we speak of the mystery of God, his plan that was previously hidden. So many of us say, well, I want to trust God, but I don't know what God's plan is. Did God ask you to know what his plan was? What he said was, trust me, I have a plan. Trust me. But see, here's what happens. We don't trust. Now, I hope this video clip plays right. I I gave them this this morning. I I just ran across this clip, and I thought it was... I thought it was perfect for this. I saw this and it made me laugh. Maybe. It should be movement, so. Is it moving out here? Oh. Isn't that just like God's wisdom? We're the guy in the pastor's seat like, where, where, where are we going? We're headed in the middle. There's nothing out here. And I love when the guy twirls the bottle and just looks at the guy like, you don't even know what's about to happen. Isn't that God? Isn't that what he does in our lives? He says, if you will just trust in me, hang in there. Don't move. Don't do anything. I'm about to do something great in your life. And unfortunately, we don't hang out, we don't wait. We get disgusted and we leave and we say, this has all been a joke. This isn't real. And we walk away from it before God has a chance to ever do what he wanted to do. You see, we have to trust that God's wisdom is greater than ours. We have to trust that God has something more for us. Do you really think that God would lead us in the middle of nowhere and just leave us stranded? That's what people think. People say, well, you know, God hasn't really done anything in my life for a long time. My response would be, when was the last time you trusted him to do something? You see, we come to the altar and we say, we trust you, God. And we drop stuff off at the altar or we ask God to do things for us. And we say, we believe in you. And then we walk out of here and we complain or we we're scared or we just take matters in our own hands because we forgot that we asked God to take care of it. And we try to take care of it ourselves. If you think I'm lying, just ask yourself, have you done that before? Have you come to the altar and given God something only to take it back with you to your seat and then walk out the door with it? And then later complain, you know, I asked God and he didn't do a thing. Now here's the other side of that. God doesn't always do what we think he's going to do. He definitely doesn't do everything that we think he should do. Because you know, like little children, we think we want all kinds of things, but not everything's good for us. And God knows what's good for us. I still think a Reese cup a day is not enough. I'm not talking like two cups. They put that in a pack. I'm a two pack a day kind of guy. You got to have at least four. But they tell me that's not good for me. Well, they probably know better than me. I got news for you. God knows better than all of us. Because he is the creator. He knows what we need. He knows what we want. 
But the rulers of this world have not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. That is what the scriptures mean when they say, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. How many people do we know are like these rulers who didn't understand? I have so many people that I am acquaintances with or that I know who say, that's great, I'm glad you get something out of church. But you know, I've never gotten anything out of church. I can't get anything out of anything if I don't ever go either. When's the last time you've been? Well, I haven't been since I was a child. Well, there's your problem. If somebody asks me about Walmart here in town, my answer to them is I can't answer that. I haven't been there, and I don't win the last year I was in this Walmart. I can't talk about something I don't know. The only way I can talk about it is if I've given it a chance, if I've shown up, if I've been involved. If you know nothing about Christ, how can you say you don't like him? How can you say you don't trust him? What you're really saying is you don't know him. That's what you're really saying. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit, for his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. Let me stop here for a second. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. So often I hear people say, you just don't know them. You might know them, but you know their inner thoughts. I know Carolyn. I don't always know her inner thoughts. I definitely don't want her to know mine. I'm not even sure I know my own. But the reality is, I can tell her, I know you feel this way. And she says, how do you know I feel that way? You don't know what I'm feeling. Well, she's absolutely right. How can I know that? Unless she shares it with me, then I will know. So many people say, well, I just don't believe them. How do you know they're lying? How do you know what they really mean? No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. So how do we get God's spirit? How do we get his trust? How do we know how to trust him? Romans 12, 3 says this. I'm sorry, I read Romans 12, 3. Galatians 3, 14. Through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessings he promised to Abraham. So in other words, now uh, Gentiles were now involved in this promise. So that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. See, if we believe and we become believers and we become followers of Jesus Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 says, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So this is saying your salvation, you're saved. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Romans 10, 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Okay, so faith, the acceptance of Christ, that brings on the Holy Spirit. Romans 10 says that faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. People say, well, I can do that without being in church. You can. You can read scripture. You can hear about Christ not being in church. But you know what? You would miss out on this fellowship. Oh, that was probably announced, but we had over 100 people here Thursday night. The fellowship was amazing. We met people we'd never seen before, and it was a great time. We miss that if we're not here. 
When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit, uh, Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. We have to be here and we have to be immersed in the Word and in the Spirit to know what God is saying to us. People say, I've never heard God talk to me. When was the last time you talked to Him? So, this week I had coffee, and it was said that my daughter said something interesting after church on Sunday. She said, Dad, now that we have finished Revelation, what will we do? We've made our way through the Bible. It's done. But isn't that how we think, right? I've made it all the way to Revelation. We're done. It's over. That's true. But you know what God wants us to do? Open it back up and start all over again. Because we discover something new every time we go through it. God's revelation is constantly happening. And so if we say, well, we're done. No reason to come back tomorrow. We've reached our goal. People say to me all the time, you know, I'm trying to get through the Bible in a year. Okay, that's great. But why? It's not a race. It's an understanding. I take my time so that I can understand it. And even then, I struggle to understand it. But what if we stopped studying the Word? What if we stopped reading Scripture? What if we stopped communicating? So I thought about this, and I thought, what if scientists who explore the ocean, the vast waters of this earth, or that explore the space, the stars, the galaxies, what if they just stopped? What if they said, you know what, let's not spend another dime on any of this. We have figured it out. First of all, for any man to think they figured anything out is hilarious. You know, it takes 13 years of school to become a surgeon. Technically, I could be one. I've been in school that long. Maybe longer. No? Okay. I spent a lot of time in school. But I have to think about that. Four of that is just their bachelors. The rest is all time spent on learning to become a surgeon. And even then, I'm sure they have doubts sometimes that they can do the job. And they have spent what seems like an eternity studying medicine. If we stopped exploring the ocean, then a year ago, or a little over a year ago, we would have missed out on 5,000 new species living on the seabed in an untouched area of the Pacific Ocean that has been identified as a future hotspot for deep sea mining according to our view of the environmental surveys done in the area. 5,000, did you even know there was new species every day? There's 5,000 new living creatures in the sea that they found over a year ago. That's a, I don't understand. Like, I would think that we've studied the ocean long enough, we would know everything that's in there. Then they come out with this megalodon or whatever it is, this shark that could probably swallow this church. Why? We don't, why did we need that? <laughs> Even if they're still in the ocean, I didn't need to know that. They're way too deep for me. Charles was enough. Let's not, let's not take it further. It's the first time the previously unknown biodiversity of the Clarion Clipperton Zone, they're called the CCZ, a mineral rich area of the ocean floor that spans 745,000 square miles between Hawaii and Mexico in the Pacific. That's bigger than Texas and California. And we could probably throw in two or three more states and it's just going to about cover the size. As Christians, we might get to the end of Scripture, but then we open it up and we start back over somewhere else. We're never done studying this. We're never done reading the Word of God. You say you don't know Him, then I say you haven't read enough. You say you don't trust Him, and I say He's not in your heart. And people say, well, why do I need to trust Him? Why not? Let me ask you this. Name somebody, 
anybody in your life, give me one, who never let you down at least once. You know, the first thought is where your mom and dad. (laughs) (laughs) Not my mom. She'll be watching. We're not streaming right now, but she'll be watching this later. She never let me down. All right? She never let me down. All right? We can say our parents. We can say our kids. (laughs) The question isn't have they, but how many times? We can say our spouse. You know that's not true. Everyone at some point has let us down. So why not put your trust in someone that says that he will never leave you, never forsake you, and will always walk beside you? Yeah, but what if he doesn't? Challenge accepted. Go ahead and do it. Now, let me clarify it by saying this. Accepting him and following him doesn't mean no more sorrows, no more pain, no more hurt, that everything will be good. What it does mean is that when you're going through troubles, he walks beside you, he comforts you, he loves you. He says to you, it will be okay. My God has me. He has cradled me in his arms. And no matter what I go through, God will be there for me. You can't buy that comfort. You know, they sell insurance for almost everything. But then you find out that insurance means nothing when it comes time to use it. I got nervous. We're going on vacation, and they always ask you at the end, do you want the insurance to cover your vacation? I always take a deep breath. I know I should. I probably should take it. But I just don't want to. It's too much money. So I hit no, and then I immediately regret it. (laughs) And then I pray that we don't get sick or something doesn't happen before we fly out. Because those tickets aren't refundable now. They're just, we use them at a different time. I don't like planning too far ahead because what's God say about plans? He'll just laugh at them because our plans are not his plans, right? But the reality is, if we truly put our faith and our trust in him. I'm not saying you won't have problems. I'm saying those problems won't mean the same as they did before. It's so much easier knowing that you have a father who loves you and cares for you. You know, our sons talk to their mother all the time. They don't talk to me a lot. That's okay. She always says, because I don't text them or call them. But they call her and text her all the time. But when they need something, when they're afraid of what they're doing or they need help, who do they call? They call their dad. Dad, I need help. Dad, could you do this for me? And it's not always that they can't do it themselves. There's just a comfort of knowing that your dad is right there with you. So if you make a mistake... He can help you through that mistake. I've gotten to the point where when they call and say, can you help? I say, sure. And I show up with my tools and I show up with my materials and I say, I'll be right here while you do it. (laughs) Because at some point they have to learn to walk through it and do it themselves. But they have the comfort of knowing that their father is standing right there beside them. And my prayer, my hope is it isn't so big that I don't know how to fix it. But see, isn't that the wisdom we have of knowing what we can handle and what we can't, knowing what we control and what we can't control? And the answer is we can't control anything. God's in control. Why not let him have control? Why not let God do what God does? Because man's wisdom doesn't work. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from the God spirit. It all sounds foolish to them and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. People read Scripture and go, I don't understand this. This is just, this doesn't sound right. Well, it's because you don't have the wisdom that it takes to read Scripture. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. And you say, well, that seems kind of odd. So we can, we can evaluate others, but they can't evaluate us. That's correct because we're evaluated on a different scale. We're evaluated by the wisdom of God and they don't understand that wisdom. So how can they evaluate wisdom they don't understand? 
That's the way it works. Who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who can know enough to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. I don't understand everything in this book. There are things that I read and I say, man, I just don't understand what he's saying there. But I ask for God's wisdom. I ask for his spirit to lead me to find it and figure it out. And he can do that for you. Even if you know him and you say, but you don't understand, I, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, but I just don't feel like God's there for me. I don't feel like God's got, got me wrapped in his arms. I feel like God has abandoned me. Maybe check your spiritual life. Maybe you're lacking in something. Maybe you're lacking in prayer. Maybe you're lacking in scripture. Maybe you're just lacking in trusting the one that you've put your faith in. If I say that I have put my faith in you, then I'm going to put my faith in you. If you say you're going to put your faith in God, then put your faith in God. Let God show you. I've never understood not giving God a chance. What is there to lose? Have you looked around? Pretty bad out there right now. It can't make it worse by loving God. It can't make it worse by accepting his son. You say, yeah, but it'll, it'll make me look stupid. It'll make me look weak. I'll look like someone who just buys into anything. Did you watch the debate? <laughs> We're already buying into anything. I mean, we think there's no other options. Stupidity is already running rampant in this world. How can you look any stupider just by accepting Jesus Christ? You say, well, only weak people accept Jesus Christ. I don't know about that. I've never thought of myself as weak. Most of you probably haven't thought of yourself as weak. I know some very intelligent people in this world who have IQs that are way higher than Jeff's. And yet they see the value in understanding who Jesus Christ is. They see the value in believing in a God who has created everything. And they're way smarter than any of us. Their IQs are up there. But they understand that none of this just happened by mistake. So why not put your faith and your trust in a God who says, I can give you wisdom like no other? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. Father, we just pray that you would open hearts, you would open minds, you would open eyes and ears, Lord, that we would just, Lord, we would just cry out and beg for your spirit, that we would accept your son if we haven't already done so. Lord, help us to find the beginning and the understanding of wisdom. Help us to have enough strength to put our trust in you. Lord, help us to be like the man in the passenger seat who he couldn't figure it out. He didn't know what was going on, but he stuck around and he waited and it paid off. God, I don't always know what you're doing in my life, but I trust you enough to stick around and believe in you and trust in you that you have this because in all honesty, I don't have it. I need you. I need your son. And I pray that if anyone here today still doesn't know you that way, if they still haven't accepted your son, Jesus Christ, if they're struggling to trust in you, that today they will come to the altar and they will put all their trust in you. They will no longer put it in man. They'll no longer put it in themselves, but that they will trust in you. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. And in his precious name we pray. Amen.
Jesus is mine He's been my fourth man in the fire Time after time I'm born of His Spirit I'm washed in His blood And what He did for me Trust in God, my Savior. It's easy to think that this is all too good to be true. We've all purchased something where it said it's this price and then you go to check out and it went from $29.99 to $300 because there's hidden fees. Or you've tried to use a warranty that you paid for only to find out it covers one part and that's the part that never breaks. We get so angry at those things. We get cynical, we get mad. We say nothing is what it seems. But I'm here to tell you that God is everything that he seems. He doesn't have any hidden fees, any cost. He is who he says he is, and you can believe and trust in that. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this time together. Lord, we thank you for your house, that we can come and we can worship freely. 
Lord, that you always never fail, Lord, to fill it with your Holy Spirit. And for that, we thank you. Lord, we just pray that you be with everyone as they leave today, Lord. Just watch over them and protect them. In your son's name we pray, amen.